Hey guys, I'm Dave Troll and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Today we're building a hidden storage unit locked with a magnetic key. A while back, one of my customers came to me with an idea for a hidden storage unit built into a shelf. We weren't really convinced that was the way to go and talked about it for a while. Then he recently found another idea that was more like hidden behind a piece of artwork. That's kind of where we're going today. We figured out the size, I found the hardware, and the project was a go. I've added links for all the interesting hardware I used on this piece below. This build wasn't without some challenges. Fussy hardware, overheating camera equipment, overheated woodworker, but I got through it, and in the end, it came out pretty cool. Let's take a look and see how it came together. Like most of my projects, this one started at the miter saw, rough cutting the frame stock to length. I needed two pieces of 24 inches and two pieces of 13 inches. But when I rough cut them, I leave them about an inch long. The first piece I'd cut had a fairly long check or a crack in the end grain. So I measured in from the end of the check and came back and cut that off later. I still don't have a jointer, yet, so I used another method to flatten out the first face of each piece. I hot glued them to a piece of MDF to act as a known flat surface. Then I marked the face with a pencil and took each piece to the planer and planed the top face parallel with the MDF. I knew it was flat when all the pencil lines were planed away. Once each piece had a flat face, I could pop it off the MDF and clean up the hot melt glue from both pieces with a chisel. To make sure I knew which face was not flat, I again made several pencil lines across that side. When each board had a flat face, it was time to plan the other face parallel to the first. Once I got close to my final dimension, three quarters of an inch in this case, I switched my planer to its finishing speed and made one last pass on each face to minimize sanding later. With two parallel faces, I needed to get my first square edge. Again, without a jointer, I had to improvise. I got out my handy dandy straight edge jig, clamped each piece in place and ripped one edge square to the faces. If you'd like a jig like this, I'll leave a link below to Drew at Fisher Shop, where you can get a set of plans for yourself. Now that I've got one edge squared to the faces, it's time to rip down the other edge to its final width. Well, sort of. I'll leave it about a sixteenth inch wide to clean up on the next step. Now, I know this step makes some folks cringe, but it works for me. I set my planer to make a light cut on the edge of the stock I've just cut to width, and pass them through two at a time. One pass on each side, and the saw marks are cleaned up. Just make sure the pieces go through the planer together to provide support as they move through. You don't want one piece to tip and mess up your stock. Back at the table saw, I changed from a rip blade to a cross cut blade. Then I could use my magnetic digital angle finder to tip my blade to 45 degrees. I grabbed my cross cut sled and cut one end of each piece to 45 degrees. For the second set of cuts, I need to use a stop to ensure the pieces come out the same size. When I built the sled, I wasn't thinking about long cuts, so I have to get creative with my stop blocks. I clamp a rail to the outside of the sled, and then clamp a block to the rail. It works, but it's kind of a pain. I see a new sled in my future. After switching back to my rip blade, I set the blade height for the first cut of the back rabbit. All four pieces will run at this setup, and then I adjusted the fence and blade height for the second cut. 
When cutting rabbits like this, it's important that you plan ahead so that the waste falls free from the blade after the second cut. You don't want it to be trapped between the blade and the fence, since it could come shooting back at you at a high rate of speed, and that's no fun. Another blade change, this time to a quarter inch dado set. I also tilted the blade to 45 degrees. One of the limitations of my saw is I don't have a throat plate to accept a tilted dado set. I could order one, but I didn't. I also added a sacrificial fence to my rip fence because I thought the aluminum fence might get a little too close to the blade for my comfort level. By adjusting the blade height and the fence location, I was able to create a quarter inch wide by 5 16th inch deep groove in the mitered end of my stock. I also used my miter gauge with a sacrificial face on it to both support the stock and prevent blowout on the back of the cuts. These grooves aren't centered, but are pushed a bit to the inside of the miter so they wouldn't weaken the outer edge of the joint. I had a piece of quarter inch walnut that fit the grooves I had just cut, and I used this to make my splines. The key here is to ensure the grain on the spline is 90 degrees to the grain on the box grooves. After another blade change and a few test cuts to determine the exact width of the spline, I set my stop block in place and held the spline down to the crosscut sled with the eraser end of a pencil. Just move slowly and carefully and you should be fine. And it doesn't hurt to cut one or two extras, just in case. Before gluing up a box, there are a few things I like to do first, and one of them is sanding. I use my random orbit sander and work my way from 120 through 220 grits, but only working the inside face. The edges and outer faces will be done later. Once that's done, I use a bit of blue tape on the inside of each miter to prevent any excess glue from getting on the newly sanded faces. Just make sure to keep the tape off the miter itself you'll have one hell of a struggle getting it out after the glue dries. Now I can add a bit of glue to each joint and spline and begin the assembly. It's okay if the spline sits proud of the face, but try to keep it from sliding into the rabbit for the back panel. The last side to go in takes a little juggling, but once it's in place, you can clamp up the frame for nice tight corners. Last thing you do here is check for square. If the diagonal measurements are the same, your frame is square. If it's out, use a clamp to pull the opposing corners in until your diagonals are even. I let the glue dry overnight and remove the clamps. Using a flush cut saw, I remove the excess spline material. Now you can remove the tape from the inside corners. Any glue squeeze out should pop right off using a razor knife and a sharp chisel. I also took a minute to check the back panel rabbit and remove any squeeze out or spline material that may have slid down. This is a good time to give the edges and exterior faces a quick sanding to smooth everything out. For now I only went as far as 120 grit on my random rubber sander. With the frame complete, I could cut the back and face panels. I'm working with half inch or 12 millimeter Baltic birch plywood and that comes in five foot square sheets. I use a long piece of quarter inch aluminum as a straight edge and rip the stock to width. I took that strip of Baltic birch over to my table saw and using a crosscut blade and my crosscut sled I cut the two panels to length. The back panel is cut to fit inside the rabbit. The front panel is cut just undersize of the frame, or 13 by 24 inches. I added some maple to 
the edge of the front panels to hide the laminations on the edge of the plywood. You could use edge banding or, as I did, mill some eighth inch stock and miter the corners and glue it in place. With all the parts cut to size, it's time to add some hardware. I started with the hinges and marked their location on either side of the frame. I transferred their location to the outside of the frame for the next step. I wanted the entire mortise for the hinges to be cut from the frame and not the face panel. There are several ways to do this, but I used my table saw and a crosscut sled and just nibbled away at the stock between my layout lines. I made sure that the blade height was equal to the thickness of the hinge barrel so nothing would bind up later. I cleaned up the bottom of the mortise and checked the fit, adjusting as necessary with a chisel and file. Once the hinges fit the mortises, I used a self-centering VIX bit in my drill and pre-drilled for the hinge mounting screws. I could then fasten the hinges in place and set the face panel on the frame. I used my square to mark the location for the hinges on the front panel. Then again I pre-drilled and fastened the hinges in place. This took a lot of fussing but I finally found the right location where the lock and its mating latch matched up and would release without binding. I could then fasten them in place with the included screws. After removing the hardware and sanding the entire piece at 120, 150, and 220 grits with my random over sander, everything was wiped down, blown off, and ready for finish. I gave all the pieces three coats of water-based urethane, sanding at 220 grit by hand between each coat. In the process of removing all the hardware, I seemed to have snapped off the head of one of the hinge screws. It was too low to grab with vice grips, so I had to come up with another plan. I put a quarter inch plug cutter in my drill press and lined up the cutter so it was centered over the broken screw. After drilling down about a quarter of an inch, I could pop out the material just like it was a plug. That left me with a half inch hole, so I swapped over to a half inch plug cutter and made a plug from some scrap maple. I set the plug with a little glue and a few taps with the mallet. My flush cutting saw just fit in the mortise, and I trimmed the plug off. And if you're wondering why I'm doing all this work on my drill press, it's because a storm rolled in and my outside workbench was getting soaked by some sideways rain. Joys of water. With the plug in place, I fastened the hinge back in its mortise and drilled the pilot hole for the repaired location. It's time to start putting this case together. I began by putting the hinges back in place, first on the frame, then the lid. After the broken screw incident, I chose to put them in by hand this time. I thought this would be a good time to prepare the foam insert. I'm using a product called Kaizen Foam. I set my table saw up with a crosscut blade and just ran the foam across, cutting it to size. I checked the fit and then trimmed it down until the foam fit in the frame snugly but not too tight. Next, I fastened the smaller part of the magnetic latch to the frame. With that in place, I could put the foam back in and mark the location of the latch. Then using a square and a razor knife, I could cut the foam out in that area. And then it was one more check to ensure that the foam would fit with that part of the latch in place. I considered using two layers of the foam, but the second layer was about an eighth of an inch too thick. I guess one layer is going to have to do. Now I could add the larger portion of the magnetic latch. This mechanism works well, but as I mentioned, it took some fussing to get everything lined up just right. Next come the bracket for the pneumatic piston arms. Again, make sure you get all your measurements just right or these things will fight you. Once you have both sets of brackets in place, you can snap the pistons onto their brackets. 
If you're wondering about the silver pin near the magnetic switch, that was an attempt to give the lid a bit more spring when it opened. Unfortunately, it put too much pressure on the magnetic switch, preventing it from releasing. I ended up removing the spring-loaded pin and filling the hole with a decorative walnut dowel that matched the splines. With the frustration of the pin removal, I apparently forgot to fill in the next two foam cuts. I made a relief cut for each of the piston arms so they would fold into the box as the lid closed. I also made a shallow cut for the large portion of the magnetic lock. The nice thing about this foam is it's made in layers, so you can easily take out only the depth of material you want just using a razor knife. The next thing to do was to fasten the back to the frame. The back sits in a rabbit and is held in place with a few inch and a quarter screws. I want the back to be removable in case the batteries in the magnetic switch fail. You'll be able to remove the back and the foam and get access to either the battery box or the AC cord to power the switch. And if you look closely at the back panel, you'll see I cut in a pair of keyholes with my router to hang the unit on the wall. The last thing to do was to add some double stick tape to the back of the foam to help hold it in place. While I'm attaching the tape to the foam, I'm not attaching it to the back yet. I'm going to leave that for my client to do once they've cut out the areas in the foam for whatever it is they're going to hide in here. Once they do that, they'll place a family photo over the face of the case to hide the entire unit. The cards of the magnetic switch can transmit through an inch and a half of wood, so the picture and a half inch thick lid should be no problem. While the hardware on this project was pretty finicky, the finished product is pretty sweet. And once the artwork is on there, you'd never know what was behind it. And even if you did, you couldn't get into it without the magnetic key. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this project. Was there something I could have done easier, smarter, better? Let me know. Drop me in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. And if you enjoyed this video, maybe give us a thumbs up and share it with your friends. If you haven't already, maybe think about subscribing so you see what's coming up next. I'm pretty sure I know what our next video is going to be, but let's just kind of leave it for now. So until then, have a great day. Take care. We'll see you soon.